Flip. Target one monster on the field. Destroy it. So how exactly did we go from this all the way to this? Stick around and find out as we cover the entire history of the Yu-Gi-Oh! trading card game in this series. Yu-Gi-Oh! One of the more intriguing card games ever to be released. The game has been around for nearly 18 years now and there's no indication that it will stop anytime soon. But the very nature of the game has evolved massively over the years and that's definitely no understatement. The Yu-Gi-Oh! TCG began way back in March 2002 with the release of its first ever core booster set, Legend of Blue Eyes White Dragon. Later that same month, Starter Deck Yugi and Starter Deck Kaiba were also released to the public. These sets would set the foundation for what early Yu-Gi-Oh! would become, a game mostly about who can generate higher attacks to overcome your opponent. The main thing to understand here is that during this period in the timeline, it's very fair to say that the card selection available was incredibly small. You see, Legend of Blue Eyes White Dragon was composed of 126 cards, 72 of which were normal monsters, only 5 effect monsters, 10 fusion monsters, 36 spell cards, and only 3 trap cards. While starter deck Yugi and Kaiba were released with 50 cards each, Yugi's deck had 19 cards in it that were reprints from Legend of Blue Eyes, while Kaiba's deck had another 19 cards that were found in Legend of Blue Eyes or Yugi's deck. This meant the total selection between the first set and first two starter decks was a total of 188 cards. And if you include the limited edition prints of the first few Yu-Gi-Oh! games released in North America, the total is still a bit just under 200. When you think about it, that's not very much at all. Prior to the next set, Metal Raiders, competitive players started to notice a couple things. For one, it became clear that Blue Eyes was the strongest 2 tribute monster, Summon Skull was the strongest 1 tribute monster, and Lajin was the strongest level 4 monster. As by the next set, the only card that matched his attack was 7 colored fish, as all other 1800 plus monsters had negative effects, such as Dark Elf, Jiragumo, and the Bistro Butcher. The only other beat stick that was spectacular but was very rare was Mechanical Chaser, a level 4 1850 attacker available only in tournament packs, meaning almost no players had access to Mechanical Chaser. And this overall meant that the only easy cards to obtain that were 1800 or higher that were good were Lajin and Seven Colored Fish. So prior to Metal Raiders though, a sample of one of the most powerful decks looks something like this. Summon Skull, Lajin, Neo the Magic Swordsman, and Battle Logs were your main beat sticks, alongside some of the few good effect monsters like Maneater Bug and Wall of Illusion, as well as powerful staple spells and traps, and bam, you're good to go. That was your typical unofficial meta deck back in early 2002, and I say unofficial because the meta was hardly a thing back then. I did as much research as possible to try and find an official name for this early format, but I couldn't find anything. And this makes sense because the Yu-Gi-Oh! community at this time wasn't properly established yet, and the internet was only in its very early stages in 2002. The fan-created unofficial term I found was called Summon Skull Beatdown Format, as it was one of the most widely used cards then, so in one huge way, it does make sense. So by this point, it's fair to say that the format relied heavily on beatdown monsters with some support cards, as Legend of Blue Eyes had four powerful supports being Pot of Greed, Raigeki, Dark Hole, and Monster Reborn, while Metal Raiders had Change of Heart, Heavy Storm, and Mirror Force. The next set's Spell Ruler, however, known as Magic Ruler back in the day, shifted the powerhouse into Spell Cards instead, back then known as Magic Cards. This means the name Spell Ruler was not a letdown by any means at all. The set introduced six of the most powerful spell cards at the time. Delinquent Duo, Confiscation, The Forceful Sentry, Painful Choice, Snatch Steel, and Mystical Space Typhoon. These were so influential that five of these six are still completely broken and forbidden 18 years later in the year of 2020. Overall, all of these cards as well as the aforementioned Legend of Blue Eyes and Metal Raiders cards were placed on the limited list almost immediately, with some being placed on the first ever banned list in 2004, but that's for a future video. The last set in 2002 was Pharaoh's Servant. While Spell Ruler specialized in spell cards, Pharaoh's Servant dedicated itself to trap cards. While most of them were just downright terrible, it did introduce some more prominent ones such as Time Seal, Imperial Order, and Call of the Haunted. Two other popular cards from this set were Premature Burial and Jinzo. 
Three of these are still banned to this day, or would have been if it wasn't for an errata. You see, Imperial Order received an errata where you now don't get a choice to pay or not during your standby phase. Jinzo, however, was the first tribute monster to be able to rival Summon Skull. Essentially, in exchange for 100 less attack, it came with the ability to lock down your opponent from activating some of the most powerful trap cards, and this was such a powerful effect that the card was placed on the limited list for about 4 years up until 2007. Examples of powerful traps it could counter include Mirror Force, Call of the Haunted, Dust Tornado, Imperial Order, Magic Jammer, Trap Hole, and Time Seal. Keep in mind these are only examples up until Pharaoh's Servant, but there's definitely plenty more that were released later. For now, I'm briefly going to talk about modern Yu-Gi-Oh for a bit, because I have to make a point about how Yu-Gi-Oh has historically changed over the years. If you took a step back from Yu-Gi-Oh for several years and then you chose to come back, probably the very first thing you will notice that is incredibly different now than back then can be said in two simple words, special summoning. Modern Yu-Gi-Oh is pure chaos with special summoning and swarming, and it's actually sometimes fairly easy to perform up to 20 summons in a turn. If we look at the entire year of 2002, meaning its first four core sets and two starter decks, we have approximately 530 cards. Out of these 530 cards, do you know how many cards have some sort of special summoning effect? Meaning, if they special summon themselves, or if they special summon other cards, that fits the criteria of this definition. If you really want to try and guess, pause the video for a second guess. Okay, done guessing? The answer is 38 cards, or 7.1% of 530. Which honestly wasn't as low as what I initially thought. But then I realized that 4 of these 38 are for ritual summoning very specific monsters, which means they don't have much leeway or flexibility for special summoning and storming in general. 3 of these are some of the most garbage specific special summoning conditions I've ever seen, so you'll probably never see these cards get special summon anyways. 4 of these are shitty class A tunes, and one of them special summons to your opponent's side of the field because it serves a completely different purpose. So realistically, a more accurate number would be 26, or 4.9% of 530. And you could technically throw an ultimate offering to that list as well, because while it doesn't special summon, it does let you normal summon multiple times in one turn, so it's up to you if you want to include that one for a total of 27 instead of 26. The point that I'm trying to make here is if you look at sets released nowadays, it's not very uncommon to see that at least 40 to 50% of the cards in that set have a special summoning effect in some way, shape, or form. But regardless, it's very clear that this is one of the most vivid examples of power creep in the game of Yu-Gi-Oh, and one of the main factors as to why older decks simply cannot compete with the speed of newer decks. Going back to the timeline and moving on to the year of 2003, the main powerhouse deck was still very clearly utilizing beatdown tactics. The first set in 2003, Labyrinth of Nightmare, introduced the game's first level 4 1900 beat stick, Gemini Elf. The set continued to release new powerful trap cards back then, such as Torrential Tribute and Magic Cylinder, as well as some of the most powerful stat boosting equip cards for many years to come, United We Stand and Mage Power. But among many things, Labyrinth of Nightmare introduced the game's first 1800 attacker with a powerful effect as well, Taiku the Ghost Destroyer. With the ability to banish opponent's monsters every time it caused battle damage, as well as preventing the opponent to banish cards themselves, Kaiku effectively rendered every other 1800 vanilla monster by this point inferior to it. Kaiku was such a heavily played card, and it marked the beginning of what was to come in the trading card game. High attack monsters with powerful effects as well. You see, by this point, powerful effects in monsters usually had a relatively weak stat, with the exception of Jinzo, of course. And so because of this, by this point, the majority of powerful effects were in all these aforementioned spell and trap cards that I mentioned in this video, as well as the new 2003 cards released such as Harpy's Feather Duster and Graceful Charity. But Kaiku, and to a lesser extent other cards such as Bazoo the Soul Leader, set a new standard on what defines a good monster, great stats, and a great effect. Legacy of Darkness was perhaps the first set that spotlighted a key card that would forever change the way players approach dueling. But before I get to that, the set did also introduce several key support cards for different types. For example, Warriors got Marauding Captain, Exile Force, and a reinforcement of the army, known as Rhoda. Fiends got the power of Dark Ruler Hades, and Zombie and Spellcaster support was also prominent, especially in the few later sets after this one. 
But regardless, it was around this time when players were finally able to make type-specific decks as the support was finally becoming more prominent for certain types. Legacy of Darkness also introduced a few other iconic cards, such as Last Turn, Fiber Jar, and Air Knight Parshoth, two of which eventually got banned because they had broken-like effects used in combination with other cards. But above everything else, the iconic card of the set was Yadagarasu. The introduction of Yadagarasu was the very initial stages of finally seeing a new deck that could compete with Beatdown very consistently, and even better than it in some ways. The deck would eventually become the infamous Hand Control deck, and more specifically, the Yada Lock tactic. Utilizing popular powerful cards such as Confiscation, the Forceful Sentry, Delinquent Duo, and Time Seal, in combination with Drop Off, a card that was also released in Legacy of Darkness, in addition to Don's Alug from Pharaonic Guardian, the deck was an incredibly consistent force to be reckoned with. Yadagarasu could be searched with both Sangan and Witch of the Black Forest, who could both be searched by Mystic Tomato. Alternatively, these searchers could all be dumped into the graveyard or hand by Painful Choice, who could then be revived instantly by Monster Reborn, Call of the Haunted, or Premature Burial if they weren't selected by your opponent through Painful Choice. And many of these cards could be recycled through Magician of Faith or Mask of Darkness, two more cards that could also be searched by Sangan and Witch of the Black Forest. Do you see where I'm getting at? I think I made my point when I say that the deck was the very first milestone of the game where crazy broken combos could be easily pulled to overwhelm your opponent before they even had a chance. Interestingly enough though, 2003 was not the year the deck achieved its peak power, as 2004 brought more support to make the lock even easier to achieve, but that's for the next video of course. The last two 2003 sets introduced one last mechanic that in some ways was even more annoying to players than the Yada Lock, and that is the premise of FTKs, which means first turn kill. Magician's Force introduced Magical Scientist and Royal Magical Library, while the last set of the year, Dark Crisis, introduced a very notorious card, Butterfly Dagger Elma. These three cards in combination with Exodia, Metal Raider's Catapult Turtle and Feral Servant Gearfree the Iron Knight created two separate infinite combos that would lead to FTKs. You see, if Magical Scientist and Catapult Turtle were on the field, you could essentially destroy your opponent in one single turn through tributing a bunch of fusion monsters. While if you had both Gearfried and Royal Magical Library on the field alongside Butterfly Dagger Elma in your hand, you could basically draw your entire deck in one turn by just repeatedly activating Butterfly Dagger over and over and over again. Both of these were incredibly annoying to deal with, but I will say, however, that these decks were not the most consistent thing in the world yet, as you couldn't really search out most of these cards fast enough. And if you did manage to FTK your opponent using one of these, I would have to say that for once, I agree with the typical whining statement, you just got lucky because you did and you managed to start with all your FTK pieces in your starting hand, otherwise you're not FTKing anybody. Still though, if you were playing Yu-Gi-Oh competitively in the latter half of 2003, I think it's fair to say that Yu-Gi-Oh was bullshit during these few months. If you weren't taking 6 plus fusion monsters down your throat from a turtle, you were probably out in the streets protesting about how a little cute bird ruined your entire life. And I say all this because the fact that despite all these ridiculous combos were starting to take into effect, there was no official forbidden list in Yu-Gi-Oh yet. Sure, there were cards that were in the limited and semi-limited list, but that doesn't mean you couldn't play them and do your best to search them. You also couldn't play anti-meta cards as the meta barely existed during the initial years of the card game, and there simply wasn't a large enough card pool with cards to specifically counter problematic cards. Yu-Gi-Oh!'s first forbidden list was set in October of 2004, a step that was necessary as a direct response to 2004's first set, Invasion of Chaos. Want to know more about the history of Yu-Gi-Oh!'s timeline and formats? Like and subscribe to stay tuned for the next episode!